in our Communicating uh, Your Science series. Today is our Meet the Reporter, Reporter um, event and um, is our Meet the Reporter event. And this will allow our uh, science, um, our Graduate Center of Science students, and I believe we have a couple of faculty members as well, to actually learn how to communicate your science to a layman's audience, how to talk with reporters. I'm gonna turn it over uh, quickly to, um, well, first, I'm sorry, we'll just go through the agenda really quickly. Um, uh, uh, Nina Gray, who is our executive director of the Advanced Science Research Center is gonna chat with you very briefly. Uh, then Emily uh, Labor Warner from the, um, uh, from the Graduate Center's School of Journalism is going to join uh, join us and give a bit of a presentation. Then we'll have a mini workshop and then we will break out into the various interview sessions and we'll come back for a little bit of conversation. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nina Gray um, to share a few thoughts and a bit of information. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for participating today. This is a really important topic. I think this past year with the pandemic has in particular showed us all how important and how difficult it is to communicate science to the public um, and uh, shown, I think, also the obligation of scientists to be part of educating the public about science and, and making it a priority. Um, so I think this is really an essential part of training in science graduate programs and in postdoctoral fellowships now. Um, so I'm really glad that that we could help contribute to this. And I want to thank the organizers for the event, in particular, Sean Rea, who's put a lot of work into the entire series, as well as into today's event. Um, I also think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, uh, thank you to the, to the reporters who are here to uh, help introduce our students uh, to the issues that you face when you're trying to get good information from scientists and convey that to the public. Um, I think there's no way that we could know uh, unless we actually talk to you uh, and hear from you what your issues are, what your problems are, and what we can do uh, to improve the communication between scientists and reporters and the public. So uh, this is just fantastic. I'm, I'm really looking forward to today and I hope everyone learns a lot um, on both sides of the conversation. Um, I also wanted to just point out, I think Sean, you have a couple slides next. That there are other, there are avenues um, to, to practice what you might learn today, which you may not necessarily have a story that's being published that's gonna uh, put you in front of a reporter right away, but there are other ways for you to put into practice what you learn um, in order to communicate to the public. Uh, the Graduate Center has uh, something called the Thought Project blog, um, where, which they're looking to um, have members of the community uh, pitch to not just the Graduate Center community, but the, the, the larger public, uh, what they're working on and why it's important. Um, and there are always other avenues for that. So if you have ideas on something that you want to write about, you can also always reach out, I think, to, to people like me, to people like Josh Brumberg, who's on the call, and to people in the communications office like Sean, um, to ask, well, where could I put this? Uh, and, and, and is there any uh, mechanism of support for that? So keep that in mind as you're working on your, on your uh, research. And with that, I just wanna give you guys as much time as possible um, to talk to each other um, and, and, and address this important issue of communicating science to the public. So thanks very much. And I'm very glad to have all of you here today. Nina, uh, and, and guys, are you all seeing the URLs for both the Nina mentioned the Thought Project blog? Is that showing up for you all? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So yeah, so, so that is the URL. Please check it out. If you're interested in writing for it, reach out to, uh, to me. And then also we have our Science Communications Academy where you can find a lot of detailed information about how to best uh, communicate your science to the public. Um, so that said, I'm going to now introduce and hand off to Emily Labor Warren, who has been a tremendous partner um, uh, in, in both this and some other events that we've been doing, uh, that we've done over the past year. So Emily, go ahead um, and take it away. Okay, great. Um, so I'm the head of um, health and science uh, reporting at the CUNY J School and I'm very, very excited to be here with 20 of my alums who are working journalists. Um, and we're, it's very exciting to have this opportunity to chat with scientists in a more casual way, maybe even build some like ongoing collaborations or even friendships. 
Um, you know, we rely on you. You are our bread and butter. You know, usually we're reaching out to you often on deadline, asking for your time. Uh, so first of all, it's really nice to be able to give back. Um, but I also want to point out that, you know, while you might feel like, oh, you know, you're struggling to get your work noticed, you know, how do I get seen? The fact is that to us, you are all essentially celebrities. You know, maybe not everyone here is like Beyonce or Bob Dylan, but everyone here is at least like Mindy Kaling or like Blair Underwood, seriously. You know, just like, you know, uh, performing artists or CEOs are the touchstones and currency for journalists who cover the arts or business. For us, it's you all, right? So this is not hyperbole. I really mean that it's, it's, it's exciting to connect and have this opportunity to develop working relationships with scientists. So I also really uh, wanna thank Sean Ria uh, for her vision to bring together scientists and journalists and her creativity um, and inspired ideas about how to do it uh, productively. Um, so I'm just gonna really briefly go over some like big picture, like stuff science and journalism, um, and then we'll move on to the more hands-on part of the, the program. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> when you're talking to a journalist, <clears throat> It's useful to realize that journalists always needs two things. One is the why now, right? So even though science is incremental and there's rarely these moments where you go, ba ba, like I've discovered this new thing, right? It doesn't really work that way. But for journalists, even if it's just like one of those incremental sort of signposts, we need to be able to hook a story to something that just happened or recently happened or is trending, right? So that's something just to bear in mind. And if you can help provide it, that's great. Um, and then the why it matters. So, you know, as a, as a scientist, you may be very hyper-focused on the research that you're doing. And of course it's embedded in this larger program that you may kind of take for granted at this point because it's such a like given for you, but that's where it's useful to think about how can I step back and think about for someone who isn't deep, deep in this, like, why does it matter? Like, why am I doing this work? Why do I feel passionate about it? What is the larger sort of the larger questions, the larger goals of what I'm doing. So that's just a helpful thing to keep in mind too. So another like little thing is like, you know, be aware if a reporter asks you a question that may sound like, I don't know, stupid or <laughs> just basic, don't assume they're unprepared. Okay. Because a lot of times the reporter may know the answer to the question, but they're asking you because they want it in your own words, right? They want to be able to convey your take on it to the audience. So that's just like something to be aware of. Another thing is language, you know, try to use accessible language. You know, scientists are very um, specific about, um, you know, the language they use, we call it jargon on our side of the table, but, um, you know, you want to be extremely precise, which of course is very important. Now, journalists also want to be um, accurate, um, but there's a different level of precision in order to really reach like a general audience, you're going to need to be comfortable with dialing down the precision a little bit. Um, Having metaphors in your back pocket is a great thing. Um, so that's something just to start sort of noodling in your head of can you come up with any? And I'll give you um, just one example to give you an idea. So I recently did a COVID related story and I was speaking to um, an immunologist at Michigan State University named Andrew Olive. And he said to me, uh, with things like COVID, I think it's going to be very parallel to TB, where you have this Goldilocks situation, where you need that perfect amount of inflammation to control the virus and not damage the lungs. So as soon as he said Goldilocks situation, I was like, bing, bing, right? I knew I was going to quote him on that. So that's just like a really useful thing to bear in mind, you know, we're looking for that. Um, emotion, right? So on one hand, yes, we're reaching out for you, to you for information. But, you know, audiences want to know about the experience, right, the scientist experience as well. Um, so, you know, think about like, you know, how did you feel, you know, when you got this finding and were there any surprises or obstacles or funny things or anything that happened along the way? Scientists often take themselves out of their work. I think that's part of your training. So we want you to put yourself back into it a little bit. So that's just another thing to bear in mind. Um, and now just going to like another topic that's not so much about the interview uh, with the, the 
the journalist, but more like, how do I get attention? Because you may be thinking like, why do some studies get covered and other studies don't? Like, why is my research not getting covered and that kind of thing? So here's a few just like uh, little tidbits of advice. And this is a much longer conversation that we don't really have time to have right now, but I thought I'd just give you a few pieces of advice. So one, it sounds really superficial and it is, but just the title of your study. Like if you title it, you know, IGCE antigen, blah, 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 it's not gonna grab attention the way it might if you gave it a more chatty and sort of intriguing sort of conversational title. Um, we scan through tons of studies and often the ones that catch our eye are the ones that make us go, ooh, that looks interesting. So same with abstracts. I mean, obviously you need to do what you need to do in your abstract, but you can also add a couple sentences of context to sort of show why you care and why this matters and why this might have social implications. Um, another thing, this is like, I tell this to all scientists, often they'll reach out to a journalist and say, hey, I just had a study published last week. Do you wanna write about it? And it's like, ooh, I wish I'd known in advance because ideally the journalist will publish their story on the same day that your research comes out. After it's already come out, it's very quickly becomes old to us as a study that is. So um, just you know, bear that in mind. As soon as a study gets um, accepted by a journal and you feel pretty sure, you feel sure it's going to be published, you have maybe a draft, that's the moment to reach out to journalists and start telling them, hey, I have this interesting study. Um, another thing a colleague mentioned to me is your online faculty page. You know, if it just says neuroscientist, that's not very helpful. But if you talk about all the different, you know, topic areas that you're that you're looking into, the things you're passionate about, you know, just give a little more depth to it. That gives us like an opportunity to say, oh, I want to talk to this person about X. And then one last thing is there are um, databases of experts that are available to science journalists. Um, here are just a few of them right here, Cyline, 500 women scientists, and then diverse sources for um, people of color. But basically you could register on these, it won't take long, and that's another opportunity. So I'm gonna um, pass along to the next phase now, but just say, you know, I'm really excited for what you all do today. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, I just wanna add, I'm gonna go back for a second, that these databases that Emily mentioned um, if you go to uh, the Science Communications Academy page that we shared earlier, you will find links to these databases where you can, where you can register, uh, you can check them out and, and register with the appropriate ones. Um, and I will just also add that the beefing up, and most of the participants on here are students, but you have LinkedIn pages, and, and I believe you also have um, um, part of the commons, you, you have your pages there too it would be great to, to really beef up the information on those pages and so that as people seek out expertise and, and they Google you, they really have a good sense of what you can talk about and, and how you present your, your science. So those are two steps that you can really take to uh, begin the journey. Um, so now we're gonna move into the mini workshop. I don't think I actually introduced myself when we got started, so I apologize for that. I'm Sean Rhea. I'm a um, uh, media relations manager for the Graduate Center. I very specifically focus on the sciences across the Graduate Center, working with students and faculty, um, both at the GC, and obviously you all are spread out on, on a variety of campuses and also with the Advanced Science Research Center. Um, so I wanna um, uh, add on to, and, and dig a little deeper into some of the tips that Emily just shared. Um, about how you actually begin to craft language that makes all this very complex science, these, this very detailed science that you all are involved in um, accessible and exciting to lay audiences. And Emily hit up on something that I encounter quite frequently, um, the specificity that scientists have around their work, which is really critical when you are doing the research and you're writing those journal papers but for a lay audience, it's sometimes less is more. Um, that's where the anecdotes come in really handy. And even sometimes the generalizations. Um, and so knowing your audience is really, really critical. So one of the first tips um, that, I, that I wanna highlight is using layman's language. The average person doesn't know what a pluripotent, stem, what a pluripotent cell is. So instead you might wanna say something like a self-renewing cell that produces almost any type of cellular tissue that the body needs. A lot more words, but obviously much more understandable to a lay audience. They, they understand exactly what the function is. 
Um, you want to use short, concise sentences, um, which kind of contradicts what I just said. But nevertheless, um, this will help your audience better absorb new concepts. I noticed that quite often in, in scientific papers, they're very long sentences, sometimes breaking up those sentences in, into uh, multiple ones um, will be better and, and using obviously more accessible language. Um, something that's the exact opposite, you wanna communicate the new information first. So you only have a few seconds to capture the attention. So you don't wanna bury your lead. Um, we're in a journal article, um, Researchers will start with the background, supporting details, and then give the results and conclusion. You want to actually do the exact opposite for the general public. You want to tell them the bottom line first. This is what the discovery is. Um, this is why it's important. And then you can go into what your support, supporting details are. Um, you want to also know your audience. This will help you determine your best why it matters message. So for example, why it matters is going to be different to to funders um, uh, as compared to the industry uh, who maybe is looking to take your discovery and, 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 and find a marketable uh, use for it to peers and the general public. Uh, so I'm gonna, now we're gonna, I'm gonna um, have you guys watch a video. I don't know if people are familiar with Wired's Five Levels series, but it's actually a really great series that you can find on YouTube. You all may wanna check it out, but it's fantastic for showing how you can talk about the same science to various audiences. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this, which I think is about nine minutes in length, so. Um. My name is Bobby Kesturi. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago and a neuroscientist at Argonne National Labs. What the connectome is, is it's a kind of a newly made up term for describing a kind of neuroscience research where we try to map the brain at a scale that's never been mapped before. Every person here can leave with understanding it at some level. Do you know why we're here today? Because we're talking about science. Yes, we're going to talk about science. And we're going to talk about a very specific kind of science about people who study brains. Do you know what a brain is? What is it? Something that helps you remember things. Definitely. So what we're going to talk about, this is something that people study in the brain called the connectome. Do you know that your body is made up of really tiny things called cells? Um, yes. Okay. Well, there's more cells in your brain, like way more cells than, than all the stars we can see. <laughs> And so what the connectome is, is we'd like to know where every cell in your brain is and how it talks to every other cell in your brain. That was awesome, Daniel. Thank you. Connectome? Connectome. To be honest, I have no idea. That's good. That's a great place to start. There are cells in your brain. Those brain cells are connected by wires to each other. Electricity travels down those wires and communicates from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain. And each of those brain cells makes you know, a thousand connections, something like a hundred trillion connections uh, in one brain, in your brain. Could I take all of that information and put it inside a computer? Would that computer then be you? Computers, they don't have feelings. They won't have feelings. And I think that's one thing that makes the human race wrong. I would say that that map also has your feelings in it. Because here's why. Your feelings, most neuroscientists think, come from your brain anyway. And amazingly, whether when you feel happy or sad or angry or scared, that's just brain cells communicating with each other. So I think today we're going to talk about a connector. Do you, have yeah. you ever heard of that? A connectome? Yeah. No, I, awesome. I don't Good. think so. <laughs> it's a map of all the connections between every neuron in your brain. Uh, um, literally, in a human brain, something like the map of 
one quadrillion connections that a hundred billion neurons make with each other. Is this like a, a, a map where that's like an actual visual representation, like using microscopy or yes. just data? Wow, wow. Yeah. I'm understanding more so that it's these, these, the a mapping of the neuro, the, the circuitry, the pathways between neurons that can lead to evidence of patterns in your brain that are common between different people. We have to use electron microscopes. Mm -hmm. And then what we have been developing are ways to slice the brain into really thin slices, use an electron microscope to take a picture of each slice, and then use computers to put it all back. Imagine that we could get the map of every connection, right? And we knew how neurons fire. Do you think we could put that in a computer, that map, and then therefore that computer should be able to think just like the brain that we extracted. Well, the computer only communicates with itself in binary, so it only has two options. It can only ask itself yes or no questions, but a human brain has an infinity of directions that it can go. Neurons are also um, uh, digital, uh, meaning a neuron either fires or it doesn't mm -hmm. fire. So that's either one or a zero. Uh, and it's the combination of those ones or zeros that actually produce the 10,000 different answers that you say. It's a large scale attempt to understand the wiring map of the brain, actually. Yeah. Great. I think that it's definitely needed. Huh. Um, understanding the anatomy of the brain is definitely important, but it doesn't necessarily tell us everything about the function. So there's some sort of temporal order from neuron to neuron and region to region that we may not be able to pick up. This is where it gets really crazy. Mm -hmm. Could we simulate that map inside a computer? And would that computer then be thinking like that original brain for which we made the map? I mean, that's not, that's not the person. I mean, having a representation of someone's neural network is just that. It's just a representation of their neural network. Huh. I mean, because there's more to the to you in here than just information passing between neurons. I'd like to think so. <laughs> huh. It would be like if you simulated a hurricane. Imagine we could keep track of every variable of a hurricane. Okay. Wind speed, every water molecule, et cetera, et cetera, temperature. And we put that inside a super fast computer mm -hmm. and we simulated it, right? I don't think anyone would think that the inside of the computer would get wet. Uh, uh, even though we had simulated the hurricane mm -hmm. perfectly. That wetness is consciousness, is what we are. Is it ethical to imagine mapping a, a male brain versus a female brain to look for differences between those, to explain alleged behavioral differences between them? Every single person is different, and so it should be okay to map every single person's brain. I mean, I understand that there are, that it's very sensitive, you know, Wait, what do you mapping think is sensitive? An, mapping an Indian brain versus a Caucasian brain, or politically, I think that people may have some issue with mapping out what causes or what makes a difference between huh. different types of people. Maybe a wiring diagram is not sufficient to understand the brain. And it would be crazy to think that that would be sufficient, actually. If you limit the connectome to be just the wiring diagram without, you know, more information about uh, myelination or glial cells, or Correct. all types of environmental features that surround, you know, the neurons and axons, then, then you have an incomplete picture. Right. No doubt. Sometimes when people get, um, they worry about connectomics, I think what they're actually worrying about is that it's the end of the way that we used to do neuroscience. What do you think about memory? Do you think that there's um, ways of resolving what the, the substrate of human memory is? You know, is it just LTP and LTD? I'm not sure if you had a connectome of a human brain, uh, of an adult human, I would be able to read out memories from that. Uh, uh, of, of you don't think it's just the memory. synaptic weights, like a, an artificial neural network gets trained to do particular It could things. absolutely be, but without knowing what the weights were before the memory was made. What if you uh, had a violinist learn a piece of Bach music? And, you yes. Know, could you find those notes somewhere in their brain? And yes. They didn't know before. Yes. Um, you know, I, I'm a musician, and I don't think it's possible. I think that there are too many 
you know, so much of it is associative to what you already know. Uh -huh. to... and, and as a musician, how much of it do you think is in your hands versus in your brains? Uh, meaning, like, you do have connections in your uh, muscles from the nerves that are from your spinal cord. Uh, what if some of the learning is there? Are you still doing EM or? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we do a lot of x-ray in addition to EM. And this is actually, I'm not saying it's the only problem, but it's the only problem that needs to be solved right away is that the data analysis, right? In fact, I think we calculated that there aren't enough humans ever to map a mouse brain uh, uh, at, where, at, where you collect every connection and uh, uh, et cetera. So the problem is to get algorithms to, to trace, to recognize things in brains the way humans uh, 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 recognize things in brains or map things, trace things in, in brains. It's going to cost a lot of money uh, to imagine setting the gold standard for the wiring diagram, even once. And that's what I'm, those are the kinds of ethical concerns that I'm worried about. One of the things that we're not doing well as a field is sort of educating and telling people beyond our field the benefits of what we can achieve. And I'm impressed that when you talk to people about something that seems kind of crazy and outlandish and perhaps they hadn't been talking about before, it doesn't take them long to come to a kind of considered opinion, especially children. I think it's kind of amazing. I mean, I do hope that more people talk about brains and what we use brains for and, and the ways that we should use our brains. So I think this field has the opportunity to make that more real. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna come out of the PowerPoint for a minute. We'll go, I'll go back in it in a second um, uh, and, and stop sharing uh, momentarily. Um, I, I, first of all, I want to make sure everybody was able to see that. If you weren't, I will share a link in the chat. Um, so raise a finger if, if you had any issues and I'll share a link in the chat and you can go back and check it out later. But what I think is really obvious through this video is that there you can talk about your science to a multitude of audiences. I think when you're talking to the media, um, the goal is to kind of try and hit somewhere right in the middle. Um, that's a good kind of comfortable space to be in where you assume people have some level of knowledge, um, you know, because they're readers, uh, but you understand that they are not in fact scientists. Um, so, uh, okay, I don't see any raised, raised fingers. So I'm going to assume that everyone uh, was able to see that. And I will share my screen again. So now we're going to move into the um, we're going to move into the um, the workshop part of uh, of the day, and we're going to I, I want you all uh, um, if you have some paper and pencil that's great. If not, then maybe you can kind of push the screen to the side in a moment and um, pull up a word doc and and begin making some notes. But uh, in preparation for the interviews that you're about to go into, and I'm gonna look at the time because it's 2.31. So we'll give you about 20 minutes. In preparation for the interviews that you all are gonna, are, are getting ready to go into, I'd like you all to each take a look at the questions that are in this section and prepare some short responses. So I prepare some sample responses. Um, but the first question that uh, you'll discuss with the scientists is, what is the big question that you're pursuing through your current research? Um, and this may be specific to a current experiment that you're working on, but I also wanna encourage you to think more broadly. What is the big question that you're attempting to answer? And so maybe you're running a, you know, a series of experiments that are pushing you towards figuring out even an, you know, an aspect of this. Well, what we wanna know is what, what's the big question that you're pursuing? You wanna uh, state your uh, broadly, use broad, broadly and concisely state the goal of your research in about one or two sentences and how you're working to answer this question. So how did you get interested in this work? So for you, what was the aha moment in your education, um, you know, or just your, your personal experience that made you become interested in, in your field? The next question that they'll, they'll want to probe a bit with you is, you know, what do you think makes your work most relevant in people's lives? So this is where you really want to get at the practical application. And a practical application may be, so for example, in this particular example, um, 
we have a, a photonics researcher who obviously does a lot of very complex experiments um, that can be very challenging to, to understand as physics often is. But at the end of the day, his work is really about creating technology that makes the use of our phones um, a more, um, uh, uh, more responsive, it, 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 it maybe can help us develop quantum computing or even new uh, techniques for medical imaging that doesn't currently exist, more accurate medical imaging that doesn't currently exist. Um, but if your work isn't on the product side, let's say, for example, you're an astronomer, there are, are amazing discoveries that come from astronomy that um, are, are now, we have GPS from the kinds of research that's been done, uh, you know, for for, us, um, for the use of astronomy. So think about kind of the practical ways that you research, or even if it's just expanding a conversation that's of interest to the general public. And then the final thing I want you to consider is what single result has inspired or surprised you um, in, in some of the research that you've done. So um, before you guys get started, I'm going to, I'll, I'll bring this back up again, but I'm just gonna stop sharing and if there are any questions, someone please raise their hand and I will um, I'll try and address it before. But the rest of you guys can go ahead and get started. I, I will put those questions back up momentarily. So, uh, okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, I'm gonna put them back up. And you can also, um, I'm gonna leave them small in case someone wants to ping me in the chat um, so I can actually see the, I can see the chat. Actually, no, I can't see the chat. <laughs> um, okay, so it is now, what time is it? It's now 2.35, so at 2.55, um, I'll check in actually at 2.50 to see where everyone is. And if you need the extra five minutes, then I'll give it to you. And then Rima will start breaking, sending people into the breakout rooms, so.
I'm sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Um, I just thought I'd check in to see how everyone is. Are you feeling like you need a few more minutes? Any questions at this point? You can unmute if you if you have a question. Just would you like a few more minutes? No, we're all good. Give me some thumbs up if we're all good. Okay, you're all ready. Okay, great. So um, just before we're gonna we're gonna start breaking out now. I did just find for all the journalists who are here, thank you so very much. I did just learn that we had a few Rima. We wish we had a few um, people who signed up who fell out. How many are we short? Is it four? I think about four people. Yeah, four people. Okay. So yeah. here's what here's what I think we're gonna do to remedy the situation. A, a Slack room so that if people want to, after this, gather and continue the conversation, that can happen. But I'm gonna turn this over to Emily now um, so we can get started on the conversation because we are running a bit yeah. of a schedule. Yeah. So yeah, hi everyone. And I'm, I apologize that this is running a little bit late. So we're just gonna take, if you have an extra 10 minutes, we're just gonna take a little time to kind of uh, debrief from the experience. Um, so I'm just, I'm gonna ask a question to the scientists first and then I'll ask one to the journalists. But um, so for the scientists, I'm curious, like did anyone feel a shift between the first and the second conversation that you had? Like, did there something that felt maybe easier or different the second time around? Does anybody wanna um, address that? Uh, I'm trying to think you can like just pipe in or, or text. Bye Samia, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'm, I'm Sejal. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at ASRC. Um, so for me, the first one was more like, you know, how would you pitch these questions and how would you answer them? And it was more of a conversation that what could be done, what could be improved. The second session was more like an interview. What do you do? How do you do it? What did you find? So it was pretty much like um, me giving the answers um, and no feedback. Uh, so more like an interview. And how did that feel? Felt pretty great. It's like uh, you gave a little heads up, uh, you know, just to rehearse it out. Yeah, that sounds great that you sort of had a run, like kind of a run through experience and yeah. then like a more of a, an actual like, you know, more of a, a real life type of one. That's great. Does anyone else, any other scientists want to um, about the same? Um, Anyone else want to comment on that? I'll just wait like another few seconds. I know that sometimes it's hard on Slack, I mean, on Zoom to. Um, so, uh, so I put about the same. Um, I felt that it was, I felt very comfortable um, because it was more of a conversation. And what was interesting is that the reporter um, was actually interesting interested in what I was saying and, 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 and may have had some background in um, this area. So, so that was good. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things about, you know, we have all these trained health and science journalists. It's a very different experience to be interviewed by someone who has grounding in the material than someone right. who just, like has absolutely no idea and probably you'll encounter both over the course of your career. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this kind of interview a lot more. Um, uh, let me ask the journalists, um, is there anything that you would wanna share with the scientists, like having had this experience, like a, about something that, a, a good way, something for them to know about connecting with you in a way that's useful? Like, is there anything that you were like, huh, this really worked or huh, maybe this would have worked better or, um, just any advice to the scientists that, that the reporters might have? Um, I'll say something <laughs> in the event that it could be useful in some way. Um, I really enjoyed both my interviews and really appreciate the availability of everybody. And um, I thought they were super interesting. Um, I guess my one piece of advice um, Although I feel like, I mean, these these people are the experts, not me. Um, my my one piece of advice would just be, um, I don't know, make sure, I, I, I think making sure to talk slowly, um, especially when things are really complex. Like when we're talking, for example, about, um, you know, a, some, an advanced, um, you know, type of chemical reaction 
or an, uh, a pretty, you know, complex form, uh, life form, um, just kind of take it slow, um, enunciate really clearly, and break down any sort of like jargon um, that comes up. Because um, while sometimes reporters do have expertise in the particular area, sometimes they might not. So they might get overwhelmed with lots of kind of advanced language and stuff. Okay, can you send them a sound please? I'm doing something. I'm sorry, folks. No worries. It, looks like Carlos, it looks like Carlos had raised his hand a little bit. Yes, early. yes. Thank you, Aaron. That's very helpful, right? To like go slow and just kind of, you know, try and yeah, be very clear about what you're trying to say and, and sort of the shorter sentences. Okay, Carlos, what, what were you going to add? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that uh, in, in my conversation um, with ZPay, um, something that grab my attention is that she she was a um really engaged with with, with his research but in, in also not only in the professional way but also with a emotional uh, and personal uh, uh, experience she talked to me about her family she talked she talked to me uh, about the chinese culture and that that helped me to envision the, the, the topic beside, you know, the, the hard data. So that that works very well. And also uh, she used she use, uh, a couple of, of metaphors comparing uh, how, you know, how to understand the brain comparing to uh, building a house and uh, stuff like that. So that makes the, the, the job for the reporter very easy. I'm not saying that scientists have to you know, elaborate complex metaphors, but if you feel natural uh, telling them, I mean, that could work. Um, and, and the conversation is, is, you know, it's actually kind of fun to, to have that uh, familiar conversa conversation. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, so that's just, that's something we kind of touched on earlier, just like, you know, being a full person and bringing your experience, not just your data to the table is something that's very, very welcome to us as journalists. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the metaphor thing, always a good thing. Um, let me ask the scientists, um, are there any questions that you have, have, having gone through this, about how to prepare for an interview or about, you know, con, you know, being part of an interview, anything that you're curious about or confused about? No. Uh, Alyssa, you're you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Um, I was going to say um, it's it was a very interesting kind of dynamic between my two interviews that um, both were obviously coming from different places. Um, do you all? I guess any of the journalists want to chime in on this, um, or does it depend kind of what? type of story you're writing, but to focus kind of more on how your research is kind of going to help, for example, public health or, or kind of a general benefit or whether you should kind of focus on the kind of popular interest of, you know, the general public on what your research is, um, or does it really depend kind of based on, on what you're writing for and, and who you who you're writing for. Brett, were you wanting to respond to that? I could Yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um I love when you can connect what you're researching to people, like human beings in our lives. So like if you're studying uh you know cells or like a, a chemical reaction, like I want to know what that's going to do for me, a regular human being, and why I should care about that. Because at some point in whatever story we write, we're probably gonna have to have a, a section that says like, and this means that blah, blah, blah for society or people or the country or whatever. Um, there are some things that are just really cool no matter what, like explosions or whatever, uh, that will just grab interest, uh, you know, if regardless of the human impact. Uh, but so often it's just really helpful to have like a, an easy answer for what this means for humanity. 
Thank you. That's yeah, that's awesome. And I, I'm going to just mention something that you probably may have read already on the chat that Ben Powers put in there, but I thought it was a really good advice for the scientists, which is to start with the big picture and then drill down into the details. I mean, of course, it's a conversation. So it depends also on what the reporter is asking you. But he was saying like, you know, and void jargon if you can at the beginning. So kind of like to help orient us sort of like kind of along the lines of what Brett was saying, like, you know, the why it matters. And then we can, you know, dive into more of the details. Um, any, anyone else have more that they wanted to, to add to that? I do, Emily. Yeah, um, cool. I thought that um, Olga was great actually in like doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and especially because she also talked to Sophia then had to re-explain again. But I think in the interviews I've done with scientists, just a general advice of like, um, typically what I do and most journalists do is like actually just answer the question I ask you. And then at the end, most journalists will ask like, what didn't I ask about? And that's the time to go into um, like most journalists, like it's practice to just like the last question is, okay, what didn't I ask you about? And that's the time to sort of like go into maybe something that I didn't think to ask about. But if you sort of launch into that, Olga did not do this at all. Like she was really great. Um, <laughs> but I've had this happen a lot where researchers are just so excited or they're like, this is really important because X, Y, and Z, and they launch into something like really detailed that derails my, the whole thing. And then it's really hard to get back to sort of like the core, like I need the basic information to make sure I'm not misrepresenting your research um, before we can get maybe to some cool, interesting thing that maybe I'll include. Um, that's just like a basic thing that I think researchers in that I've interviewed um, in the past tend to sometimes get a little off yeah. track, but I will let you go there. Just wait, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah. Or if you find yourself as a scientist, I've had that happen too, where they'll like talk for half an hour without taking a breath and you don't even have a moment to redirect. So if you find yourself getting excited and going off, which is great, it's good. You could stop for a second and just check in and say, is this, you know, am I am I on the track that you're interested in? You know, if you are, because sometimes you might be totally giving exactly what the person needs, but other times not. And it's kind of awkward to interrupt when someone is talking. So, um, you know, if, if you go off in that direction and maybe check in. Anybody else like scientist or journalist want to just, you know, share anything, um, just reflections on the experience? So, <clears throat> oh, let me turn on my video. I, you know, um, I've, spoken, I'm at City College in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, and I've, I've spoken with reporters before, uh, but it really made a difference that, you know, the two that I spoke with had some, did have some grounding today, uh, and genuinely seemed interested in what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, reading some of the stuff in the chat, the, you know, the, the real audience here for me, isn't the reporter, it's the reporter's audience. Uh, and uh, that audience uh, can sometimes be, you know, have blinders on when it, we talk about earth science. And, and uh, you know, I run into it all the time where they're, they're just, they just zone out because they already have a negative view of, uh, you know, whether climate change is real and things like that. And I'm, I'm not really sure, uh, I guess that's, part of the reporter's job is to is to break that barrier but um you know it's it it, it uh I'm, I'm very frustrated with the situation uh dealing with that segment of society so. well that's i mean that's obviously a huge problem for us as well right you know it's like there's people who aren't even listening so you know it's but um but that's, you know, it is our job to figure out how to connect the audience to what you have to say, right? But the more that you're aware that is, that's like so on target that you're thinking about that because that helps if you're already thinking about that as well. Um, thank you. And I, Carlos, did you want to say something else? Um, just something very quick. Um, as you mentioned, I mean, it's very important that scientists are able to to tell us that, I mean, how this research is important for society or what benefits they are going to bring. But um, at the same time, I mean, it, it's very important that they have to be very clear with us and they have, they have to be very honest um, to say, okay, I mean, this is just a theoretical work at this stage. 
or oh, this is, has been tested only in, in, in laboratories. I mean, we, we want to avoid to bring false expectations to the public. And if the scientist is very clear with that, that does not necessarily mean that we are going to reject the story. For example, I, I, write, I write a lot about quantum mechanics and most of those experiments are just very tiny things that happen in a, you know, close laboratory and it's going to be, we are years far away to, uh, for, far away to see a real benefit from those experiments. But still I write about those experiments because people find them uh, irrelevant. So if, if, if the, yeah, if the research doesn't mean uh, immediate benefit for the, for the public right now, it, it doesn't mean that it's not necessarily newsworthy. Great. So I, look, I see we're losing people now because I know we're getting very close to four o'clock and we're running quite a bit over. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap, but uh, just two quick things. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna hold on as people leave, but check your chat because there are just a couple of pieces of information and I will follow up with everyone to make sure that you have bios on both sides in case there are people, scientists for the reporters and for the, for the scientists reporters that you wanna follow up with. So thank you all, this has been wonderful. I'll just maybe do one last plug for the Slack channel. Um, it's 